Well, it was no less than five years ago when I first stood up here. I turned to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, and, uh, and I said, so what is Hebrews all about? Five years ago. Well, a lot has happened uh, in that time. Uh, some of you uh, weren't here at all. Some of you were. Some of you might not even remember back that far when we started Hebrews. But when I started preaching on Hebrews, no one had heard of COVID-19. <laughs> uh, there was no war in Ukraine. The Queen was still the Queen, and Boris Johnson wasn't the Prime Minister yet. So it's quite a long while ago. We've had four Prime Ministers since that time. <laughs> and a lot has changed in um, the makeup of this church as well, and in what God has done here. Um, probably five years ago, some of you here, who are now members of the church, hadn't even heard of Grace Baptist Church Halifax. And uh, here you are now. Some of you were not even Christians five years ago. And here you are now. And that's very encouraging, isn't it? The way God has dealt with us in that time. All of you have faced challenges of some kind. All of you have faced concerns, worries of one kind or another. But the point is, okay, you're here now, which means you're still here now. You're still going. I look around the room and I see you brothers and sisters as persevering. And still here, still in the race, still running, still serving, still living for the Lord Jesus Christ. If you were a Christian those five years ago, you can say, I'm still a Christian. If you've only recently been converted, you too can say, I'm still a Christian. Why is that? It's because God is eternally committed to you as his child, as a believer in Christ. And that is the message we get from this closing benediction to this wonderful letter we've been working our way through. How um, the writer is wanting them, longing for them to know the power of God to keep them and to equip them for everything good, to persevere, to do his will, to keep them in Christ, to whom be glory forever. Now what did I say five years ago when I started preaching on Hebrews um, by way of introduction? I'm sure no one will remember and I had to look back myself. But the first words I said was, if you've ever felt like giving up, Hebrews is the book for you. Because that's, that's really what Hebrews is about. It's, it's written to Christians who felt like giving up, who felt like going back to their old lives in Judaism and saying, oh, it was just easier now. Oh, we didn't get so much trouble when we were Jewish people, we hadn't become Christians, and maybe we should go back to that old one of living. We'll just give up on this Christianity thing and go back to our old paths. And the writer is writing to say, don't do that. No, keep going. Be encouraged. God's on your side. It might be difficult, but he is for you and he will help you. So um, you might not hear me be here thinking, Will I still be a Christian in five years' time? In November 2028, will I still be going? You might be thinking that. But you might be wondering how you might make it through the next five days, and then the next five years, or maybe the next five minutes. But the point is, just so you know, you, you can't make it through the next five minutes. You can't make it through the next five days. Not, not as you are. You can't make it through the next five years, let alone 50 years. But if you're in Christ... If you're still holding on to him, however weakly you might be doing that, I repeat, God is eternally committed to you. It's him and his power that keeps you going. And it's that that we need to keep hold of. Not our own strength, not, oh, will I make it? Oh, what will happen if something bad happens? No, God has got you. God will keep going with you and for you and through you. So listen to Hebrews, listen, you've been listening for five years very patiently, of course we had a big break during the pandemic, so it's not exactly been every week we've been preaching here, and we've had bits of other books as we've gone along. But here we are, still here, listen to what it says, the author says, many other people, weak though they are, they have done it before you, there's a great cloud of witnesses we're surrounded by, there's other people who did give up, and it didn't go well for them, that's, that's also a very striking and, and sobering note in the book of Hebrews. Don't be like that. He says, keep your eyes 
on Jesus. And by the way, he says, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. And that's what he's doing here in these final verses of the book. That's how he ends and that's how we're going to end. You see the form of what he's saying, verse 20, if you have it open in front of you. Now may the God of peace, who brought through, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will. It's a prayer. He's asked them to pray for him. In verse 18, pray for us. And now he says, I'm going to return the favour if you like. I'm going to pray for you. And as he prays then, we mustn't miss what he puts his confidence. And if you haven't picked it up already, it's he puts his confidence in God. And that's the first of two things that I want to say this evening. I hope fairly briefly as we just bring this book to a close. First, put your confidence in God. Put confidence in God. Easy to put it somewhere else. Temptation always to look to other things, look to yourself. But he says, put confidence in God. And that's what he's doing in this, in this wonderful benediction at the end of the letter. He starts with who God is. He goes on to what God has done. He ends with saying how God will receive the glory for all that has happened. So who is this God? Quite simply, we're told in verse 20, he's the God of peace. Now may the God of peace do this for you. That is, he's the God who makes peace. And of course, when the Bible talks about God making peace, we don't so much mean he's the God who is able to bring peace in the Middle East. We don't so much mean he's the God who's able to bring peace into my messed up family, or peace between me and my neighbour, or peace in some other kind of horizontal sense there. That, that is uh, what God can do, but when the Bible speaks of this more often than not, what it means is this God is the God who makes sinners right with him, who makes peace vertically between God and human beings, who forgives sins and who says we're no longer enemies. And so that's the kind of God we're dealing with, a God who reconciles himself to, to us in our need and our sin, a God who makes the way through the Lord Jesus for us to be right with him. And uh, because of that, then, we do receive from him a resulting sense of peace. Yes, there's this kind of definitive peace that is just accomplished in one sense, whether we feel it or not, but then that leads to us knowing the peace of God, knowing a sense of his presence with us and his help day by day, knowing he's not against us, he's for us, he's on our side, he loves us, he's put his Holy Spirit in us, and we experience him then as a God of peace, not as a God who's at war with us, but a God who is on our side and who loves us. And the author is saying, I'm praying that you will know this God and that you'll put your confidence in that God, the God of peace. That's who he is. He loves peace, he provides peace whatever your unrest, whatever your difficulty, because he has made peace through the Lord Jesus Christ and the blood of his cross. And that's what he goes on to describe then in terms of what God has done. So he said who this God is, what has this God done? He has, we're told in verse 20, through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep. So you see here you've got, if you like, cross and resurrection in one, haven't you here? What has he done? He has brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus. Well, how did he do that? Well, it's an interesting way that he puts it. He says he brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus through the blood of the eternal covenant. Now, that's an unusual way of saying it. He's saying he raised Jesus by means of the cross. You see what he's saying? Through the blood of the eternal covenant... Through the blood of the cross, the covenant sealed with Jesus' blood, the agreement that God made to sinners in the gospel, through that blood, he raised Jesus from the dead. What's it saying? I think he means that the resurrection of Jesus was God's uh, only possible response to the sacrifice of his son on the cross. It was him saying, son, you have pleased me infinitely through giving your life, shedding your blood, for your people in full and uh, willing obedience to, to me. And so, son, because of what you've done on the cross, I will reward you by raising you from the dead. It's a similar thought to what Paul says in Philippians 2, how, how the son went all the way down. He even humbled himself to death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him. Therefore, God said, well done, son. And he raised him from the dead. So it's in that sense, through 
the blood shed on the cross, God raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand. Because actually that, that, that when he says that he brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that's a rather unusual word in the original where it says he brought him back. It's literally the, the, the word that the Bible uses for leading someone up. So you could translate it, he led him up from the dead. It's the same phrase that's often used to describe how the people of Israel were led up out of Egypt, like an, an exodus away from the land of slavery and into freedom. And it's seeing Jesus' resurrection as that, God leading him up, leading him out of the grave and leading him to a place of safety and exaltation. It's implying the ascension in with the resurrection. So that's the kind of theology that's going on, right? But... Um, this is important because that it's, it's not actually the theme of the benediction. It's not the theme of the prayer. It's not saying, I pray about the resurrection. I pray about the cross. No, this is all the preamble, if you like, to the point at which he's driving. Because if you see it with me, he says, Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant raised Jesus, etc., may he do what? Equip you with everything good. That's the prayer. The prayer is that he may equip them and that they might do his will, and that he might work in us what's pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ. So he lays this foundation of who God is, God of peace, what God's done, cross and resurrection, all so that he might say, because of all that now, God will equip you. God will make it possible for you to live this life that flows from the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. And what is lovely about this is that in, in a number of ways, the author is kind of subtly saying, what's happened to Jesus, that I've just been describing, cross and resurrection, that too, God will ensure happens to you. He's been raised and lifted up. He's uh, been exalted. And uh, in, by the work of the Spirit, that will happen to you too. Why do I say that? Because, first of all, Jesus is called the great shepherd of the sheep. In other words, the implication is, Jesus is a shepherd, he has sheep too. God led him up, what's the shepherd going to do? He's going to lead up his sheep. They're going to follow him the way that he's gone. So you can have confidence in God because he is committed to your progress. He will lead you up in Christ through his great shepherd, the Lord Jesus. And in verse 21 where it says, may he equip you with everything good. That word equip, again, is a word that is used earlier in Hebrews. But it's a word that's used in chapter 10 for describing how God equipped Jesus um, with a body. A body you have prepared for me, says in chapter 10, verse 5, um, that he might do his will. It's the same word, equipping Jesus with a body for doing what, what God wanted. He will equip us also in Christ for doing what is good uh, in the likeness of Christ. And then when he says, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will, that word doing his will is the same word used for what God is going to do in us. He says, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he literally do, same word, in us, may he work in us what is pleasing to him. In other words, what we do through God equipping us to do good works is precisely the same doing that God will be at work to accomplish through us as we live Christian lives. So he's saying, may he equip you to do what he has already intended to do through you. So it's like, are we doing it? Is God doing it? Is it me? Is it the Holy Spirit? Well, the answer to all those questions is yes. As we live, as we respond in confidence to the gospel, as we start to work out our faith, that's God working in us what is pleasing to him. Just as, again, Paul says in Philippians, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who works in you to do and to act according to his own good pleasure. So as we follow, that's God working. And so for all these reasons then, what God, who God is, what God has done, and then what he calls us to do to his glory, we can have confidence that God will be committed to us to work out his purposes in us. That's what this prayer is doing. He's praying for his believing friends. And we can pray these two for each other and we can see it working out in our lives. So that, as it says at the end of verse 21, that Jesus Christ may get all the glory forever and ever. Amen. As 
I said earlier, um, tonight Andrew and I had the privilege of being with a, a thousand other church leaders in uh, Blackpool this week uh, at the FIC uh, Leaders Conference and uh, there was much that was encouraging. Uh, news of people being saved across the churches, across the nation, many people coming to faith in Lord Jesus, churches growing, churches encouraged, of course churches facing challenges too and uh, things that are hard, and things to navigate as independent evangelical churches and yet much um, in terms of stories of God at work in these ways, saving people but also just sustaining people and one particular conversation I had with another pastor really stuck with me um, I knew this guy from another conference that I go to in a different part of the year. His name's Sam. He's a pastor down in Norfolk, in a little place called Dis. And um, I was chatting to Sam, and he's in a kind of rural church. I said, How, how's it going? You've seen people saved? He said, well, no, we've not really seen people saved. But I'm just as encouraged by seeing people make it to the end. Well, I said, what do you mean? Well, he said, let me give you an example. There's a lady who's been in our church for a number of years. She's an older lady. She's been really quite ill recently and it looked like she was going to, to die, going to be with her saviour. Uh, she was kind of struggling with her health and so I went to see her over a number of weeks and she gradually declined and declined to the day when time came for her to die and as she was there on her bed she was dying he said I was praying with her and she said basically time for me to go now and she died. Full of faith in Christ. And Sam said it was it was November the 5th. And the moment that she died, all the fireworks started going on. And he said, I thought that was so appropriate. It was almost like God was saying, well done. You've made it to the end. Welcome. You know, all the fireworks go off. As it were, in heaven as well as on earth. That's, that's what a pastor's job is. To, to see somebody, not just converted, but to make it to the end. And he had such joy in saying... It's great. I didn't I just have the privilege of seeing this lady saved at some point in my ministry, but walking with her all the way to the end. Now, you know what? It's not just a pastor's joy, a human pastor's joy, an earthly pastor's joy, if you like, to do that, but it's the, the heavenly pastor's joy to, do, to see that too. The, the great shepherd of the sheep, he wants his people to make it to the end, and they will. If we keep doing his will, seeking to serve him in this world. This God of peace will equip us for doing that. So have confidence in God. Put your confidence in God. That's the first thing. Here's the second thing out of these two things. Just as we conclude these last few sentences of the letter. Place your value in God. Place value in God. You might say these are just a kind of handful of uh, little exhortations at the end. Little kind of details and and, and notices almost at the end of his letter um, from verses 22 down to 25. But I think they just give us examples of how this putting your confidence in God kind of cashes out in real life. How does it kind of have an impact? Four things in terms of what we should value when we place our value in God, having had this confidence in God. Number one, value God's word. Brothers and sisters, verse 22, I urge you to bear with my word of exhortation. For in fact, I bring it to you quite briefly. When I was at um, uh, seminary, I remember being taught Hebrews, and the, the lecturer on the book of Hebrews said, This letter could only be, have been written by a pastor because he calls a letter that uh, lasts for 13 chapters writing quite briefly. Um, so, yes, maybe that's true, maybe it's not. It probably is a sermon that's been kind of written down, and then these are the few things that he's kind of added to the sermon at the end. But whether it's uh, truly brief, whether that's, I think it's a kind of um, a convention in the ancient world to have written about your brief word of exhortation. The point is not, much, not so much about the brevity, but the urging. He's urging them to bear with his word of exhortation because this is my word from God to you. So he's saying, value God's word, bear with it, listen to it, do what I say. And God will bless you, God will help you, God will keep you. Look at the examples I've given you, look at the exhortations, look at the warnings, heed them, heed the encouragements, look at Christ, value him above all things, and know that God's word is speaking to you. Value God's word. Will you do that? Will you let God's word shape you and mould you? Don't stand in judgment over it. Don't say, well, I don't like that bit. I prefer this bit. Say, if you're speaking to me, Lord, I want to do what you say. Value God's word. 
Second value, God's mercies, verse 23. He says, I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released. Now, um, I, I'm pretty sure, I might be wrong, I'm pretty sure that this is the only uh, part of the New Testament which indicates that at some point, Timothy, one of Paul's co-workers, had in fact been imprisoned for his faith because now we're told, I'd like you to know, Timothy's no longer in prison, he's been released, good news. And he wants them to know that, they might not have heard this. Maybe they've been praying for Timothy, we don't know any of the details, but it's good news that our brother Timothy has been released. One of God's many mercies. Of course, there's no guarantee that Christians who are in prison for their faith will be released. There's no guarantee that their lives will kind of be easy or that the authorities will start liking them now. We don't know that, but it is still a small and real mercy that in this situation, a man who is in prison for Christ is now being released. We don't know how or why or when, but we know that he's no longer in prison. And we too should be thankful, shouldn't we, for mercies like that. We can thank God that none of us are in prison for our faith now. There may be a time where that's called for, where pastors in the UK may end up in prison. Who knows? I don't know. But we can thank God for his mercy. Thank God for his mercy of having the freedom to gather like this. His mercy of having brothers and sisters in Christ to support one another. We have a Bible in our own language that we can read. We have great Christian books we can read. All mercies that come from God. We can thank him for that and value what he's given to us. So value God's word, value God's mercies. Value God's people. Value God's people. Obviously, part of the reason for mentioning Timothy is because they, he wants them to value him. He says in verse 23, if he arrives soon, I'll come with him to see you. So he's possibly sending Timothy to them, he's saying, I'm going to come too. Great to see you. And let's value each other. Verse 24, value your leaders as well. We looked at this last time in more detail. Agree all your leaders and all the Lord's people. So they're to value everyone, rich and poor, uh, strong and weak, uh, same ethnicity, different ethnicity, young and old. They're to value all God's people. Greet them all, greet your leaders, respect and love your leaders. Listen to their teaching, like he said last time. Value God's people. Is that what we are doing? Are we saying, yes, I want to be with God's people. I want to pray with God's people. I want to support God's people. I want to learn from God's people. And then there's this lovely little note at the end of verse 24. It says, those from Italy send you their greetings. Well, we don't exactly know where the author was when he wrote, or where even the Hebrews were. But I suspect they were in Italy. That the, the, the readers were probably in Rome, perhaps. Um, and the writer is somewhere else. And he's got some of their friends there from Italy. People who are their compatriots who are currently with him. And he says, oh, they all remember you and they want to send their greetings. It's like if you were abroad or something, you know, or if I was abroad perhaps, and I was, uh, and I met some British people there, and I said, oh, well, they'll send their greetings back to back home where their British friends are, or something like that. That's the kind of thing you say. In other words, there's this unity, isn't there? Wherever the people of God are, He wants them to have this value of each other. They're sending greetings to one another. So value God's people. Don't despise those who may be different to you. Don't, um, don't get annoyed with those who you find it, they rub you up the wrong way. Ask for God's grace and mercy. Help is help to, to love and value all God's people. So value God's word, value God's mercy, value God's people, and value God's grace. That's the end now, isn't it, of the letter. Grace be with you all. You know, I think many of you know what that, what that word encapsulates, what it points to the undeserved favour and kindness of God. And that's where he wants to leave it. He's written this letter, hasn't he, exhorting them, saying, do this and live like this and keep persevering and on all of this. And maybe they feel somewhat overwhelmed with all these instructions, perhaps, as sometimes you might. And yet he says, my last word to you is the word of grace. That is, God is at work in you. God will keep you. God will give you undeserved kindness. You're not going to go and earn his love, you're going to go and receive it as a gift from his gracious hand. So value God's grace. Don't get into the kind of hamster wheel of thinking, oh, you've got to do all this stuff in the book of Hebrews. No, remember what Hebrews is about. The Lord Jesus Christ, the finished work, it's all done. 
He's the great high priest. He's seated on our high. He's there. He's going to help his people. He's the great shepherd of the sheep. We can believe that God is eternally committed to us through the cross and the resurrection and the sovereign Lord Jesus seated on high now. Grace be with you all. That's the message. And we can live in confidence of that. So place your confidence in God. Place your value in God. Value his word, his mercies, his people and his grace. May God help us to do so. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your words to us this evening and pray you'd help us to put our confidence in you and to value your word and your mercies and your people and your grace. May it be that you do equip us with everything good for doing your will and may the glory come to the Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever. Amen. Amen.